I'm Kerry Stinson, and my journey through life has been quite an adventure. For over 20 years, I played Barney the Dinosaur on tour and seven seasons of the hugely popular TV show, Barney and Friends. Now my journey is to bring together friends and guests from all over the entertainment world for inspiring and at times amusing behind the scenes conversation. I'm Kerry Stinson, and this is Purple Roads. Welcome to Purple Roads. My name is Kerry Stinson, and get ready. We are going to have a blast today. We've got a, a, he's a good friend, known him for a long time, and I'm just thrilled he's here. Chris Rager, voice actor. He's done a lot of stuff that you know, and uh, we're going to have a lot of fun. Chris, how are you? Uh, I am well, sir. How are you, sir? I'm great and glad to have you on the show. Glad to be here. You know, you've been on and done one uh, an episode with Josh. I did. But I was, I I was did. like, we got to do a full episode here. We got to really get into it. So uh, uh, I'm not sure I'm that interesting. Yeah, you are that interesting. <laughs> I've known you for a long time. You're very interesting. Here's here's my cat who is <laughs> climbing on things right now. <laughs> so, and I know some of this, but I'm going to learn some stuff today, which I always love about it. <laughs> oh, excuse me. Actor, comedian, obviously doing the voiceover stuff. You're you're teaching now too, so we're going to get into all that kind of stuff, but. How did you start in the entertainment business? Where did it start for you? Well, <laughs> you know, I always had memories as a kid of, you know, watching certain shows and this and that and going, I can do that. Uh, I could do that. You know, but that's not something truly viable, you know, even at that age. And voiceover for me at a young age was like Mel Blank. That was it. <laughs> you know, it wasn't like I had a, a slew of voice actors that I was aware of, you know, Hannah right. Barbera came around and all that stuff. But so, um, you know, I was always artistic. I always was into music and, and art and those kinds of things. Um, and so when I got to the college level, uh, I kind of leaned on that a little bit. I knew it wasn't going to do music. Uh, so I was leaning on the art and oddly enough, one semester, I didn't have $16 for a lab fee. Uh, for my drawing two class and so that semester I took an acting class instead thinking oh that'll be fun uh you know <laughs> could see what that's all about well I loved it and on top of that uh people were telling me that hey you're you're pretty good at this you should pursue this right so from there you know I sort of submerged myself a little bit more at some point I had was no longer taking like basic courses, government, English, those kinds of things. I was just taking <laughs> theater classes. Right. Um, I, you know, did a, a, what they would call a continuing ed course in improv as well, and really fell in love with that. And again, people were saying, hey, you know, Chris, you're pretty good at this. You should pursue it. And so I continued to do that, ended up leaving uh, Brookhaven College here in the Dallas County Community College District, of which uh, both of my parents taught in the community college oh, district. I didn't know that. My mom was the uh, uh, for for a time the fine arts director at Brookhaven, and uh, but mostly taught music theory and piano. Uh, and my mom. And go ahead. What did she think of all this? When you were getting well, into acting. Well, I'll tell you, in my 20s, I wasn't the best communicator with my parents, you know, so they probably had a general idea of what I was pursuing, but uh, probably didn't take it very seriously. Um, and so uh, after college, uh, I had some friends of mine who had gone to an acting school and uh, they came back and were like, Chris, you definitely got to check this out. It's a really great school and uh, and you really kind of get, oh my gosh, my cat's destroying things. Uh, and you can really submerge yourself, you know? And um, I thought, okay, I'll check it out. Uh, turned out uh, I did like the school and I could get financial aid. And, you know, I signed up. And, you know, it was like camera, movement, voice, all this stuff, you know, it was all encompassing in being a performer. And all the teachers were at, were were working actors, so I really like that part. I'm not just that's great. 
taking a class from some some guy who used to act and now teaches. They were both, right. You know, so I like that. Uh, and along the way, I did meet Mr. Josh Martin along with a few other uh, lifelong <laughs> friends who I still am in contact with. But uh, um, yeah, I mean, that was really it. Uh, graduated from there uh, with Josh and some other guys started uh, uh, doing like comedy troops and things like that. You know, we were. Yeah. And I want to talk about that a lot sure. because that to me, I, I mean, I used to go to your shows all the time Absolutely. and to do improv like that, you know, I know it would, it would scare some people. I mean, you're literally walking up there in front of a room full of people asking for ideas, you know, in some of those games that you guys did and some of these things you did. And I know you have a general idea, but the stuff that you would come up with is, is very impressive. Oh. And I know some of it is, is, you know, some of it is sketch that you planned out, but a lot of that was improv. Where, you know, where does that come from that you're able to just, someone throws something, and you're able to, get, to run with it? I mean, I don't know where it comes from. I always, I just knew that I really liked doing it. Um, and I didn't really have a fear of the stage, you know, like some people have stage fright. Me, I was like, right. oh, this, this is awesome. People are looking at me and they're laughing and clapping and things like that. That feels good. I'm going to do more of that. You know, so um, I, you know, improv <laughs> always looks a bit more like a magic trick than it really is, you know. <laughs> Uh, but I do like that element of it because there, I do compare improv to magic sometimes. So that, so that big reveal, that aha moment kind of thing. Right. Um, and, you know, there's a lot more preparation that goes into improv than, you know, your layman maybe would understand. You know, I mean, we we all lived together, too. You know, we were always bouncing ideas off each other. And, um, you know, quite often we would find ourselves in an improv uh playing through something that we had discussed earlier that day right you know that we had laughed about played around with maybe even chosen a character or something so those moments would happen a lot uh but improv is really about a lot a lot more preparation and understanding of of the things you sort of go through in your head the rules of the game as it were um knowing when to break the rules and bring everyone sort of with you uh, kind of thing. Um, so I don't know, man, we were just a, 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 a good group of guys who, who made each other laugh. We, we knew each other's timing. We played off of each other, bounced off of each other all the time. So there was a certain element of camaraderie behind the scenes in those, in those years that took place that, um, I don't know, we probably took for granted. <laughs> well, when, when do you know, because I was curious to this, you know, let's say when you're doing one of these improv games, when do you, when do you take an idea or you, you take something and you run with it and you can kind of tell the audience is laughing and so you keep going or when do you throw it back and kind of get out? Do you know what I'm saying? You sometimes- yeah, you, are, you are sort of in those moments, you know, based on where you are at in say the game or the rules of the scene you're in. Right. Uh, you do sort of, gauge that but you are always looking for that out that sort of blackout moment where you get the big laugh and you can go on to the next thing you know uh i always like to make sure that we've uh, uh checked off the list of what's what rules we needed to uh what things we needed to cover you know i mean we always used to do this improv uh called what are you returning right it's a very generic every improviser has played what are you returning right Okay. Uh, we changed, tricked it up a little bit by making it something the audience would choose. It's made out of something it wouldn't be normally made out of, you know, and that a famous person had given it to you as a gift. So you had to guess these three things, right? Right. And, uh, you know, I could always, and then you wanted to kind of do them in order so you don't, didn't confuse the, the guy having to guess, right? Um, but, you know, there was always, a, I mean, just a certain amount of familiarity with my friends and those guys that um one i knew that they were trying to be vague on purpose right, right as to screw with me <laughs> right. right so i knew when that was happening and you know in some ways they almost had to do that because we did know each other so well that 
it would it would look like we had talked about it backstage or something because I would right. I would get it right. So they had to had to at least make it kind of hard on me because our our understanding of each other uh, went 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 so well that uh, I'd be like, oh, it's this, or I would if I did guess it, I would have to maybe hold on to it a little bit longer uh, to make it look like I don't know. But uh, you know that. Well, was, I- comes with time and experience with your friends and well and I, I'm, I'm curious do you um are there times where you can tell you're you're kind of drowning but you're oh, determined sure. you're determined to turn turn that into a laugh to turn well that i think i think at a certain point in a game like that i definitely would eventually at some point break that fourth wall and let the audience know that i had no idea Right, and that that and that that I have gotten so much information, it's not very all convoluted, and I need to kind of like restart in a way. Uh, I mean, we definitely that was one of our more well-known games, and partly because they would screw with me. Uh, the audience did enjoy that, uh, but yeah, we probably had you know that game is probably supposed to take maybe you know five at the most ten minutes, and we we had twenty minute one of your returnings. You know, <laughs> Literally laughing at my misery of not knowing what to do or say. But is your mindset when you go into that, well, I got to complete the game, or at least that's the goal. Yes. But I also got to get some laughs, right? I mean, that's... Sure. You're in a comedy troupe. <laughs> sure. Yeah, and you would do that too. Like, if you had guessed it, you'd try to find a clever way of letting you know, the audience know and your players know that I have this and uh, that I'm going to tell this story. I'm going to go down this road of this story to let you know that I have. So everyone sort of goes, oh, okay, Chris knows it. You know, we can move on to the next thing. So all of this obviously is prepared to, you know, what you're doing now. Um, all the voice acting, uh, Dragon Ball Z, which I, you know, I know how popular that is. I know how much people love that. Had you done any voiceover acting prior other than just school? Because You've got one of those voices that it commands attention. Like you had, I mean, this is the same thing you were doing back in uh, Section Eight. Well, I guess in some ways, if it were up to like my voice teacher, uh, I was, you know, she would always tell me my voice was born for the theater. You know? <laughs> uh, and I loved doing plays and theater and whatnot, but you know, I knew as a as an actor, I wanted to make money and right. be an actor. You know. And have a you know pay bills and things so i knew theater maybe not be number one unless i was willing to move and go somewhere and i really wasn't uh and you know the mission was never to come out and be a voice actor per se uh but yeah no dragon ball was my first ever voice acting job as a playing a character um with without filming me you know i'd done some commercials and uh, very low budget films and things like that. But uh, um, when Dragon Ball came along, uh, it was like an opportunity for actors in Dallas to, uh, well, have just a little bit of consistency that we could get paid at something more regularly. And, uh, and so that was very enticing. So yeah, when an opportunity like that came along, we we all jumped at it. And, and how is that when you go into that? You see this opportunity. You're, you're auditioning for something that you could see that has the potential of being very successful. I mean, I had no idea what any kind of success would Dragon Ball bring of any sort. Right. You know, it was, we're, it's a cartoon and we're paying money. <laughs> you know, that's, and, you know, I mean, I'd certainly heard of the anime, you know, but mm-hmm. um, we didn't, at the time, I didn't call it that, you know, for me, it was still like Japanimation from when I was a kid, we watched Speed Racer and things like that. Right. Um, And uh, so the idea of anime was a little new to me, but I definitely knew what I was getting into. I knew it was a Japanese animation Mm -hmm. and we would be dubbing the voices. I got that. I understood that. Um, But, you know, uh, we didn't have, like we do now, the Japanese voices to listen to. Right. So we were just kind of flying by the seat of our pants. So I didn't have a reference of the Japanese or anyone uh, reference of uh, what that voice might sound like or could sound like 
you know, it was 1999. Uh, the internet was not as good as it is today. So looking up or finding out, you know, I mean, Mike, the only reason I knew about it was because Mike McFarland who played Master Roshi, a longtime director and voice actor out of Funimation. And he, he was uh, with you in Section 8. Yes, was with, with us in Section 8. And he was like, hey, guys, I, uh, um, I booked a part in this uh, cartoon. And these guys out in Fort Worth, they need more actors. You guys should go audition. I was like, yeah, I'll go. And they gave a part to you. God knows I can get a part. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, honestly, it was for me. It was like Mike had booked a part doing this voice that I had heard him do a thousand times, right? So for me, it was a very familiar voice. I'm like, they gave you money to do that voice? Well, shoot, I I can do that, <laughs> you know? <laughs> uh, and so not a knock on Mike. I was just, you know, right. it's it, it seemed um, uh, more real. Like, oh, I could totally get something like that, you know? So um, I went and auditioned. Uh, Mr. Satan Hercule was on the docket that day. And he looked, uh, I mean, often when I'm thinking of a voice for something, you know, I'm looking for my own experience, my own history and knowing of things I've seen and been through pop culture, family, friends, otherwise. And Mr. Satan looked very much like Hulk Hogan to me and I couldn't get it out of my head. And so that being sort of the baseline, I just sort of, I went with that kind of voice, you know. Well, you know, I think it's really important what you were just saying about with Mike and that you could get that job. I, I think that's where all the your experience comes in, right? You know, if you're new in this business, right? it's an audition, I'm scared of this and that, but you're like, I've been doing improv. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it's just right yeah, up your I mean, alley. Like I, thought, I thought to myself, look, I know Mike. I know Mike's experience level. I know, you know, uh, how and why he makes me laugh when we do this comedy show together. And I thought to myself, yeah, my, I'm no different than Mike, you know? And so I got a legitimate shot of, you know, getting paid to do cartoon voices, which sounded great. You know, I'm like, Oh, think I never thought I, like making this a thing, but I would love to do it for sure. I'm going to say, don't you think that that confidence is, is important? Not that you, you know, I'm going to go nail this and I definitely got this. Right. But go into something going, I, I know I can do this. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it definitely, it definitely helped. You know, I mean, I had uh, years of proven experience and in entertaining people and uh, working on different projects and, you know, having a plethora of impressions and character voices that I created on my own. And, you know, shoot, man, I'd, in an improv or a scene, I over over my history of my life, I've done the voice of Hulk Hogan, you know, too many times to count. Right. right? And uh, so, yeah, I mean, it was nice to be able to draw upon that experience uh, of of years of playing around, and you know, my mom saying no amount of cartoons or video games is ever going to amount to anything, kind of stuff, <laughs> and. Uh, it's been like, well, it turns out she was wrong. <laughs> and uh, it can amount to something. And uh, now I don't look like the, I don't look like the stupid lazy kid who, uh, who didn't really want to go to college. You know? <laughs> Does, uh, what is the audition process like for something like that? Are you actually, do they even care about you being able to dub and do the, the actual job? Or is it more about finding the voice and seeing if yeah, you guys connect? I, at the time, it just it seemed more about, you know, could I do a voice they enjoyed? Uh, I definitely didn't audition with any ADR or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, I was just called and told that I got the part. And uh, the ADR stuff was kind of learned on the fly. But, you know, look, it, at the end of the day, it's not rocket surgery. You know, it's it's... It's actually about things I've been trained to do over years of improv and acting lessons um, was to, to listen. Uh, also musically, you know, like I told you, I was a, I grew up a musician, played several different instruments and uh, being able to kind of have that rhythm, that timing of things, you know, that uh, 
already existed in me through through performing and doing music and stuff. You know, I found it like, oh, all the things I need to be good at this, I've got tons of experience at. And so it didn't, it didn't, it was never a daunting process to me. It was like, oh, I get it. <laughs> you know? So the learning curve was pretty easy for you. I think so. You know, and back then we had to be really good. Like today, everything's digital, you know, so mm -hmm. things can be moved and slid and compressed. But back then we were literally recording on beta tape. And it would click and whir and spin around and go through the computer. I mean, it was a thing, right? <laughs> right. And so back then we had to be much better at starting and stopping on time. And these days, uh, you don't have to be. Uh -huh. uh, you can start a little late, but just make sure that you're not having to. You can start a little early. You can start a little late. Just make sure you're not slowing down or speeding up to make up for time you think you've lost. Mm -hmm. because Pro Tools is an amazing thing and you got to set that where it needs to go and uh, without distorting it, sometimes we'll be able to stretch and compress it the line a little bit just to make it fit a little better. And if the director likes to read, boom, you're on to the next line. Yeah, yeah. and I was going to ask that, does it help you with the creative process now, being digital like that, that you don't have to worry as much about being so exact? Uh I don't know. Part of me likes it old school. Um, you know, any actor uh, likes to critique themselves and does it pretty quickly. Um, when that relationship you have with the director and whatnot, you always want to make sure you're not stepping on their toes, but, you know, listening to what they have to say. I'll usually make it known with like a little noise or something that I'm not happy with that read. You know, <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll give a little hmm or, uh, or something like that. But just to kind of let it be known that if you liked it, that's cool. I did not. <laughs> you know? um, but uh, again, that's about, you know, sort of time and experience and relationships with those, with those people, the directors and engineers and stuff. And, um, but it really is, just, it's about listening and timing and um, being able to kind of watch. I mean, it's all right there in front of you. You got a script, you got the anime in front of you. I mean, it's not like it's a mystery. It's right, right there, <laughs> you know? Play what's on the screen, right? It's drawn a certain way to give a certain reaction or thought or thing, you know? And uh, um, play what's on the screen. That's what I tell people. It's right there for you. I In improv, I, I had to make that shit up. Oh, excuse <laughs> me. You know, I had to make that up, right? I go, in anime, it's right there. Makes it much easier. Excuse me, but is there the challenge? Because we talked a little bit this last time you were on about having to make the noises. If, if there's, if you can tell the character to a grunt or a this or a that. Right. Yeah, I mean, that you know, those things. Freedom to, to play. Those things are written into the script a little bit, somewhat not. And if you do have maybe a little time to throw in a, a this or that, you know, it's more than acceptable as long as you're not changing the meaning of anything. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I always chuck uh, those grunts and things and screams and all that stuff to uh, uh, very much childhood play spaces, right? You know, those moments as a kid where you would spin around and, oh, or play out, go play, you know, war with your friends. My friends and I played war all the time. I think about it now, like, why did we play war? You know, but it seems so violent. But you know, that's what we were doing. You know, go, 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 machine guns and go, oh, and, you know. So, <laughs> uh, in a way, again, I look at it like I that was training in some way to kind of go back to that place where you do try to give a realistic death noise, you know, because you were having fun, <laughs> right? And the more realistic sounding, the more fun. It was right, unless you're like, No, you missed me, you didn't get me, right? Like, no, I shot you. You're like, No, you didn't, I'm fine. You know, you always have those moments, but so now, how many different characters have you done? Because I know you've done video games and you've done it. How many different ones have you done to this point? Um, you don't have to give me an exact number, but I don't know, man. If you look at my IMDb <laughs> page, it's over, it's over 250. 
So yeah. how do you keep them all together? That's where I want to go with this. How do well, you a lot of them all together? A lot of them are only around for a little bit and die. And so I don't have to ever <laughs> do them again. So I don't really have to remember that voice. But uh, what are you doing, Kat? Um, <laughs> But these days, I mean, they'll definitely, if it's something I, I play more regularly or maybe there's been a gap in between playing a character over a season or something like that, um, they're always really good at being able to sort of play, play it for you again. And so you're like, oh, yeah, okay, I remember where it is or where it sits and uh, what I did to uh, achieve that sound or whatever. Um, so, and that's so that, you know, they show you. They're like, here's you in this other episode. That's what you sounded like. You got it? And you're like, yeah, I'm good. And then you go. Is it is it hard to keep them, you know, how do I make this one a little bit different than than this one? And that one, I mean, when you're doing so many like that, well, is it a challenge? I, I, in that regard, I sort of uh, give credit to the, to the animators and the artists themselves, you know. Uh, in my own workshops that I teach, I have a portion of the class where we look over anime sides, like audition sides for anime, and we look at the characters and how they're drawn. And what can you gather just from that? You know, how old they are, where they maybe sit uh, socially amongst their peers, you know, are they grunt, or are they, you know, one of the cool guys, or, um, and, you know, begin to, uh, look at their place in the world and say, okay, well, what kind of voice might fit that kind of character? And, uh, you know, so like I said, for Mr. Satan, it was Hulk Hogan. He had a championship <laughs> belt on and a, and a Hogan stash. I mean, minus the blonde hair and the bald head, it was Hulk Hogan. And, 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 that, and, and in that moment, I thought the, the artist, the Japanese artist, obviously did that on purpose, Right. Uh, but apparently they didn't. Uh, you know, there have been lots of interviews, but I, I think I think they're making it up. He was clearly <laughs> based. He was clearly based on Western wrestling, and uh, uh, although they deny it, <laughs> they do. I don't know why. But uh, so yeah, Hulk Hogan. I mean, I play Mr. Torg in a Borderlands uh, a video game series. Um, they hadn't even drawn the character when I auditioned. The artist wasn't finished. And so in the audition side, it was a picture of Randy Macho Man Savage. And I thought, so I can do him. I've been doing him for years. I even incorporated some of him into Mr. Satan's voice. You know, and so, you know, sometimes a part presents, it, uh, presents itself and you're like, I got this. I don't, I don't know anyone else in this industry at this time who can do that voice, right? And uh so might as well be me. <laughs> well, it's, it's fascinating. And, and I love this because I know some of the, we get a lot of people that watch this show that want to get into the industry, been in all of this. And there's a confidence. You get to that point where you, I got this, right? And I know people are listening to this going, well, how do you get to that point where you just go, I got this? Well, um, Acting, playing characters, I should say, you've always got a bit of bring a bit of yourself, you know. Um, and you, you kind of maybe uh, you need to maybe more understand what exactly your strengths are and what matches up, what fits, you know. So look, I don't go around trying to play like younger, prettier characters because I know so many actors who can do that voice naturally, right? Where I've got to play it or tweak it. It comes off a little false, right? So, you know, you just got to understand where you sort of sit in that world and what types of characters are going to work best for you. And, um, and hopefully along the way, some of them hit, you know? Um, that's not for everybody. And sometimes they don't hit, you know? There are plenty of people who are going to try to get into this business and not have the wealth of experience that I went through, you know, from the ages of, well, I don't know, 10 to, you know, 25 when I went through acting school. <laughs> and, 
you know, and sort of sometimes wake up one day and go, oh, I want to be a voice actor because, well, my friends like my voice and, you know, I can do some funny characters and make my friends laugh and stuff like that. Yeah, but um, have you put those thoughts and feelings to the test in front of hundreds of people on a, on a stage? You know, because that's a whole different beast altogether. And having gone through that gives me a better idea of what I need to do vocally when I'm in the booth, you know, because mm-hmm. on stage, vocally, it's out here, you know, on a TV set or a film, you know, it gets, it, it gets brought in a little bit more, you know, right. so you've got to be able to play, use your voice appropriately. And then, the, and then in voiceover, you know, it comes into this, you know, circle. And again, you know, an understanding of what you can do vocally and, um, uh, being able to still kind of understand that you're not just in front of you're not just a talking head you're you're an actor you're you're moving you're expressing the, the um, physicalization of those moments that are taking place right before you in an anime scene you know not necessarily in video games you kind of use your imagination in those moments but um, yeah did that answer your question you did you did I want to go a little bit different direction here and I want to talk about the conventions. Uh, it's such a fascinating how that has blown up. Um, right. You know, from, from uh, uh, what was it? San Diego is basically the only one doing it at one point, right? To every town is doing one now. And the amount of people that come out and the fan base is, is amazing. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, when I first started, looking at conventions and trying to book some uh, on my own. Uh, I had just been through an accident. Uh, I was just kind of back on my feet again. And I was looking for other ways to bring in income. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Chris Savage told me, he's like, you should look at conventions, man. You're in Dragon Ball Z. Anyone, they'll, all, they'll take you. You're in Dragon Ball. <laughs> you know, like it was a foregone conclusion. And, you know, I did have a little bit of success in that world, you know, but um, I also hadn't played any, like, super big lead characters in the anime. And it seemed that that was sort of like what my competition was. Mm -hmm. Uh, But um, as that progressed, conventions began to progress. Like, it got to a point, at least I was strictly doing, like, anime conventions, right? Because there got to a point that there was, and probably still is, I mean, after, you know, post pandemic things, hopefully are picking back up, but there was right. literally every weekend of any week throughout the year, there was an anime convention happening. Right. And not like, you know, one here, one there. It was multiple, right. right. And, um, you know, and so that, that whole idea and world began to grow and, you know, you want to, you know, do what you can to kind of be a part of that. And then, Dragon Ball came back all of a sudden, right? We were redubbing Dragon Ball again and Dragon Ball Z Kai. Uh, There was more video games and stuff, you know, and that kept driving the popularity. Then they had a couple of movies, you know, and um, just the convention scene continued to grow and grow. And once we sort of got intermingled into what I just call pop culture cons, which kind of has a smattering from from anime to the office, mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> uh, um, and uh, involved with those, I really hadn't done any just specifically anime conventions, or I've done a whole lot of them, to be honest, because there is this crossover world with Dragon Ball, of all things, and, uh, you know, I look back and think, man, thank God Mike said something. <laughs> Because, yeah, I mean, the the idea, I mean, I remember I first signed an autograph for Dragon Ball when Score Entertainment, you know, makes baseball cards and everything. They made a card game and a card game, card trading card series for Dragon Ball. Mm -hmm. And I got called in to do a a batch signing of some of the first cards out. And they were going to pay me this much money or whatever, right? And I was sort of like, Say so what? Like, yeah, man, we'll give you like, you know, this many hundreds of dollars to come in and sign these things. I was like, and that's it. 
Yes. Okay. So, you know, I made like a, a few hundred bucks for signing these cards. And then they started doing this uh, Dragon Ball Z Hummer tour where they, a guy would drag, drive this actual military grade black Hummer with Dragon Ball Z decals all over it, which is really cool. He would drive that around the country and they would fly in the voice actors to do, you know, promotions for the tournament and sign stuff for everyone. And they'd pay you money. And, uh, you know, that just became, the, became like a, became, became a thing. You know, and I was always like, wow, that beats waiting tables or right. the other bartending or anything else I did. So, so yeah, I feel incredibly lucky uh, and uh, however you want to say it, blessed, whatever it is, to uh, uh, to be able to make part of my income uh, signing my name. It's Which crazy. Me, it's it's just like, wow, that's cool. <laughs> it is it is cool, but the reaction I've been there at a couple of them and, and seen it. I mean, the fans go crazy to meet you and want to ask you questions and get you to sign all kinds of stuff. Yeah, I mean, no, the fans are great. They really are. You know, they always always very complimentary. You know, something uh, Josh and I hear all the time. And I'm sure the other actors do too. Is uh, man, you were you were my childhood. You were you know. I grew up listening to you. And I was like, well, you were my adulthood. Thank you for helping me pay my bills, I guess. <laughs> um, but uh, so, yeah, I mean, you know, a lot of people too. I mean, uh, this happens fairly regularly. You know, Dragon Ball Z saved my life. You know, and this is why. And so you're always like, you always feel really, you know, lucky and blessed to be, have been a part of it. And affected so many people's lives, and and you know ultimately was uh, very positive ways. So, I mean, but what is that like when someone tells you? I mean, hearing this whole story and how you've gotten into this, and it's it's obviously it's it's your passion, but it's also a job. And next thing you know, you're finding out that what you did to help someone's life, and then it's that that big. Obviously, I saw it with Barney. I I went through sure. that a lot. With Barney so you know I have a perspective with it but what is your perspective on that when someone tells you a story like that well it's just you know uh, it's a heartwarming heartfelt moment you know like wow like um, and you try to just be graceful about it you know like just you know this person obviously went to, through something that was hard for them traumatic for them uh, upsetting uh, whatever it was and you know the in that moment somebody feels like sharing something like that with you and wants to be open in such a way I think uh, just trying to be uh, accepting and graceful in that moment uh, is, uh, is the best way I can describe it because I know that's what I think you know because in some ways it's, it's it's it can be a little uncomfortable right you know because you're like oh damn I didn't know we were going to go here, but wow, that's amazing. Thank you so much. And I'm very glad you watched, you know, it, right. it affected you in this way. So uh, just happy to have been a part of that and in whatever capacity that was. So, What are the questions that they, they ask? Do they want to know? Do you get questions about how to get in the business? Do you get questions about oh, yeah. what it's like to do it? And then... What are the questions they ask you? No, I mean, everyone, yeah, wants to know how I became a voice actor, you know. And, you know, I, and they ask in a variety of different ways. You know, there's, there's, one, there's the one way that people ask you, like, oh, wow, how'd you get into that? Like, I could totally do that. What, like, how, what do you do? Because I would love to do that. You know, which is, you know, mildly insulting that, just anyone can do it right you know and uh you know not have the uh you know the experience and education to fully understand you know what got me here plus in the in the in the end you know there's got to be some natural ability already you know you've already right. kind of have got to have you always have to already be slanting uh, in that 
sort of idea or direction in some way. Uh, not that it can't be learned, because it can. Just typically, that's you know what I see when people kind of go down that path. Yeah. Well, isn't that part with you know where we are today with social media and YouTube and all those things that they see all that kind of stuff and go, oh yeah, I could I can do that. It's not like because well, we and didn't I have that beforehand. And I encourage people to go down that road, you know, because that's that's how I looked at it when I was young. But again, I was young. You know, if you're right. 31 and you don't like your job and you have no acting experience whatsoever and you go, oh, I should maybe look at, look into that. Well, maybe you should. And I encourage you to, you know, to uh, look into uh, things you feel like you might may enjoy or maybe good at, you know, but, uh, you know, don't go in the notion that you're not years behind uh the talent that is currently booking work in this industry you know and uh the years of experience of of going through that of usually in the beginning you know falling on your face and you know feeling stupid until you know you mature a little bit into you know being able to understand what it is to be a performer to have feelings and to express those feelings, to uh, the thought process that goes to take you to those feelings, through physicality, through breath. You know, breath is like it's number one in any actor's tool belt because what the breath can do is it can take you there. When we have emotions, usually our breath changes in some way. Being able to understand how it changes and be able to use those, uh, use that knowledge to uh invoke emotions that you maybe aren't currently feeling you know but through breath and then through your imagination can can get there but i went on a tangent with that breath there no 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 i no you did and i think that's i think that's great how do you teach them the other part which is you may not get a paycheck for a while i i think that's such a an interesting aspect because you'll hear it, it you know you it doesn't really matter who the actor is there's a point where you have right. it, you're thin for a while and what keeps you going to go i'm gonna make this and and i'm still gonna figure out how to pay my bills you know again if you really want to get in this business i really hope you're young right because <laughs> it, it takes a little bit you know and um and as you kind of go through kind of achieving the level of quality you want as a performer, you know, yeah, you find yourself maybe doing certain things for free along the way, you know, but as you get better and people are willing to pay you money, you know, really understand what you're worth, what mm -hmm. your worth is and realize that at some point it's going to be okay to turn down those things who are still asking for you to do what you do for free. Um, and um, eventually, you, you're only working for money, you know, for right. things that will pay you money. But, you know, in the beginning, sure, it's, it's okay to do certain things for free along the way, whether it's you know, indie voiceover work and stuff like that to gain that experience. But in the end, when you achieve a certain quality you, you, and, and people are willing to pay you money for it, you know, you got to really understand what your value is and let the free stuff go after a while. <laughs> We've all had to let those free stuff, free right. stuff go. So what brings you full circle to now you're teaching? Well, um, I never, I mean, I've always dabbled in it, whether, you know, instructing or teaching um, maybe not improv itself, but like an improv game or something like that. I never, um, I never really thought about doing that. But if I was, it would probably have been improv because you know, I had so much experience there. But mm -hmm. now, after years of being a voice actor, um, when I look back on how I gained experience, it was by doing, right? Getting up and doing it. And yeah, sure, observing others around me who were doing it and saying, oh, I may do that differently, I may make a different choice. You know, uh, definitely helps you gain experience. But uh, 
um, at a certain point, I I came up with the idea because of others that I heard uh, teaching this this process we go through ADR and and, and things like that. I, I wanted to expand that a little bit with some video games and stuff because you know I, I was known for uh, some fun characters and video games and wanted to go to kind of express that idea. And um, so along the way, I came up with an idea of really not an acting class, but a doing class, you know, uh, right. doing what it is we do, whether it's through the audition process, whether it's working with the time code and the scripts and doing the ADR and the audio digital replacement, you know, putting our voices in the flaps and uh, working with different directors and, uh, and the like, uh, and also having a community around you uh, to kind of help build out from, because again, nobody really makes it in this business alone. There's usually, you know, uh, a pack or a den of friends that, uh, you know, kind of collaborate with one another and uh, uh, help motivate each other along the way. But um, where was I going with this? I'm looking for No, you. just talking about teaching and how you got into it. Yeah, so. Making that decision. So from there, I thought it'd be a really good idea to uh, to help students out there who wanted to know about what it is that we do, actually putting them through the steps that we do. And along the way, giving them notes and critiques and, and direction and help along the way. Um, so, you know, I do have a kind of a, a specific ask of the students in my class before class starts is that they have some performance experience of some kind, you know, or that, you know, they can at least show me and express to me that this is something that they're really going to continue on with and uh, sort of go down that path of, you know, being a performer, being an actor, you know. What are the things that the students struggle with the most? Um, I would say I have a lot of good students actually that come through. So not all of them struggle with this, but the ones who maybe have a little less experience uh, struggle with the idea of that I need to make a voice for this. This is a voice I need to make. And I think that voice sounds like this. When that tells me you don't have a full understanding of the character, because the character will tell you who their voice, what their voice is, right? By who they are, who they react with, how they react with others. Um, and uh, uh, and now in anime, literally the Japanese are always a great reference of where to kind of begin in that too, because you hear it, right? You want to. You want to use as many influences as you can, especially ones that are coming from the, you know, original uh, show. Right. Um, so, yeah. Did I answer that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yes. And how long does it take you to get it? That's kind of where I'm going with this. So do you just, are you able to see the character pretty quickly and go, I, I got where that is? And is that just experience? And for them, is that part of really what you have to learn? It's not the voice as much as just understanding. Yeah, I mean, I, I give a lot of credit to the improv experience I have when it comes to doing that, because that is something you have to do a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, quite often you're going into a booth that you don't know what character you're playing that day. You've never seen a script. And the director's like, here this person is, here's who they are, and whenever you're ready. <laughs> you know? and so yeah you do have to make some quick quick choices you have to commit to those choices you know and uh commit to the idea of following them through their experiences you know um but again i you know i take in that information i listen to what the japanese are doing and so i can make a better informed uh you know idea of a, a choice not a voice Right. I tell my students that a lot. We make choices, not voices. Right. I choose I choose to play in that arena of my body with the with this voice because uh, because of what I know, not because I want it. I want to make it fit. Right. Right. I, I keep going back to and, I, and I'm hearing it through this whole interview. 
there's a fearlessness, which it sounds like you probably already had some of it in you, but then obviously from improv and being on stage because, and I get what you're saying, but when, you know, when a director says, okay, here's this, 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 go. Yeah, I think sometimes that, it's easier said than, than done. And, and you're going to, people think are going to overthink comes, it. They're going to do a lot of things. I think that comes down to being willing to fail. There you go. You know, um, I'm more than happy to go in there and make my choice and for everyone to hate it. That's fine. <laughs> give me, give me more information and I'll make a different choice, you know, and, uh, and I think the more often you do that, the better you get at making the right choices. Because uh, you're more informed. And you're know, asking the right questions, too. You know, I want to make sure that I fully know, like, who am I talking to? And, and who are these people? And why are they important to me? You know, because that's going to make be me well, more well-informed as how the character may, be, may react to them, good or bad. You know? And uh, so, yeah, it's... Uh, I say it's a quick process, you know, hey, here this person is, and where are you ready to go? Uh, there's plenty of time to ask questions and fully understand what you're about to get into. Um, you know, and after you watch it, you know, watch it again. You know, if you have any questions or think thinking that, well, I don't fully have, you know, the choice I want to make here yet. You know, ask questions, ask the director, um, and listen, listen to the anime. And, uh, yeah, be willing to make the wrong choice. I think that's really important, and that advice is really important. That if if you you're because that can be in an audition, right? The, the same where you're sure you're you're making a shot at it, and you may not give a, get the role for whatever reason. But yeah, you at it, home you auditions, committed and went. At home auditions, a little more hard these days. I think you know from back in the day when you had in person auditions, you had people around you were you know, seen by the director, you could talk to them, you could ask them questions, those kinds of things. And you still find moments and opportunities for that, but they're uh, much fewer and further between than uh, kind of like stuck at home. Here's this character, here are the sides, and now you don't have anyone to talk to about it, <laughs> you know? So I always recommend for people like, hey, find you uh, an audition buddy. You know, find somebody you can who knows you and you can bounce ideas off of and someone who's not afraid to tell you, man, that sucks. You know? I think that's great advice. I actually haven't heard that before. I think that's great advice because you're right. The way it's changed and, you know, get up out of your PJ or do it in your PJs. <laughs> and, and you don't know. You right? don't know. I mean, it's much different than, you know, making yourself presentable to go somewhere and see the familiar faces you knew you were going to see, you know, because you knew the other actors in town who who were called in for the similar roles that you were going in for. I mean, me, I was always known as one of the improv guys. You know, there were always, the improv guys always got called in uh, for certain things. Things I always said, ah, oh, they don't have a script. <laughs> That's why they want the improv guys, because they want us to make their script better, right? <laughs> um, but, um, and is that so, yeah. is that hard? You mentioned that. Is that hard because the, the Japanese, I mean, it's already there. So you can't really improvise. Is that hard for an improvised actor? No, it's not. It's not. Uh, you know, improv improvising it has a lot of structure to it, <laughs> you know, uh, that uh, the audience is unaware of, you know, sort of the you know, the man behind the curtain or the, you know, is this your card kind of moment. But uh, um, I think um, I find little ways here and there, especially if it's a character like Hercule, Mr. Satan from Dragon Ball. Anytime I go in to record for that, based on what's written there, I have a little bit of freedom because the director knows that I know this character better than the writer does. And will even ask me, do you, is that something you think Mr. Satan would say? Or do you want to add a little something? Do you want to change that, you know, based on what you know your flaps available are? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I mean, 
uh, a lot of times I will change it, you know, or just because I think, you know, this is funnier. As long as it doesn't change the meaning of what's the context of what's going on within the scene. Um, but for things like that, characters you've been playing for years, uh, are you're, at least with this director, I'm afforded a certain amount of flexibility. <laughs> which, is, which is awesome when you can be yeah. given that. Well, that, you know, that they trust you to know better than they do. Because you've been this guy for 22 years. I haven't. You know, right. Does that work? Based on your experience of what you've seen him go through, through, you know, the entirety of the show. Um, it, it's just, it, it's fascinating. It's fascinating. And I can't thank you enough for being on, Chris. Hey, it's my pleasure, man. Thank you for having me, always. Hey, so we got to talk, we got to finish up, talk what you got going on this weekend. Uh, this weekend, we do yeah, have I know Hill, you're going to the Hill Country, right? Yep, the Hill Country, uh, New Braunfels, Hill County Comic Con. Uh, I'll be there with Mr. Josh Martin, our good friend Kara Edwards, who's been on the show with us, actually, uh, yes. on the Purple Roads. Uh, I do believe they have. Uh, oh, I think the voice of Scooby Doo is going to be there. Um, you remember the uh, the cute kid with the blonde spiky hair and glasses from Jerry Maguire? Yeah, oh yeah. I think he's going to be there. <laughs> uh, I think they've got the uh, the actor who played the original Flash, and then in the, in the current series, Flash's dad, and then Flash from an alternate universe, Flash. Uh, so he, he'll be there. I think he's kind of the, the bigger headliner guy. And uh, a few others that are super fun. I can't think of right now at this moment. But I, there's, there's a couple, a couple of Power Rangers. Johnny Young Bosch will be there. So that's a big uh, one. That's cool. Yeah. Is it fun for you to be hanging around those people and talk, talk a little show? Or do you get to? Are you just signing Yeah, we get to time? here and there. You know, sometimes you have to take the time to approach people and stuff. But right. Um, you know, at certain conventions, I always get happy when there's someone there that I'm a fan of, you know. Uh, I've gotten to meet, like, half the cast of The Office, who I'm a huge fan oh, that's of. That's cool. Uh, I've gotten to speak and talk with people like Will Wheaton, um, Anthony Michael Hall, who was really cool. Oh, that's cool. Josh and I sat down at lunch one day in, back in the green room area, and John Cusack and William Shatner sat down across from us. You know, we're like, huh, this is our <laughs> life. This is our lives now. <laughs> but it's we, got, it's we do cool shit like this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, that's one of the, the, the greatest lessons of this industry is you just, you never know. You just never know yeah. where it's going to take you on this journey. No doubt. I mean, I, I've met uh lots of people uh, that i'm a fan of josh has a lot of fun because he's a big wrestling fan and we meet a lot of wrestlers on the road uh they bring a lot of wrestlers out to these things and so josh is always slipping off and getting a picture with one of those oh, guys but. i know we did one with back in the barney days and i i got to meet batista oh wow and, I, and this was before any of the sure. big acting things he was doing but it was because of Josh. Right. And so Josh was like, hey, you got to go over. And I've got this great picture meeting him. And and then boom, look what happened there. So uh, right. it's crazy. Are you saying that your meeting with Bautista is the reason his career launched and uh, went uh, so high? Uh, that is not what I'm saying. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm saying it. I'm saying it. Uh, well, I appreciate that. I, I'll take whatever I can get there. Oh, my gosh. Chris, I can't thank you enough. Hey, man, I appreciate you. No problem at all. Hey, can, can you leave with a little Mr. Satan? Uh, yeah, I can do a little... <laughs> to, to put you on the spot, Mr. Improvise? <clears throat> yeah, no problem. A, I always go with the good stock Mr. Satan line that he's pretty well known for, which is, uh, uh, well, I'm sick and tired of all these laxos and tricks. If you want to fight the champ, you got to fight me, chump. Oh, yeah. How can you not smile and enjoy that? <laughs> right? Oh, man. Well, thank you so much, Chris. Carrie, it's been great, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching Purple Roads. Remember to keep your eyes, ears, and your heart open, and you'll find your Purple Road. We'll see you next week.